Um, and now it's my privilege uh, to welcome uh, Dr. William Chris. Thank you, Kirk. And um, thank all of y'all for inviting me to be here. Um, I, it feels really good in here, right? Um, and and uh, I think that is an indication of the presence of God. Um, and it's always great to be in a room full of um, inquirers. It, I, I, it reminds me of a picture that I have in my library at home of the tombstone of J. Frank Doby. J. Frank Doby was a Texas folklorist and historian at the University of Texas. Um, and what he had put on his tombstone was, um, I have come to regard liberated minds as the greatest good of life on earth. Um, and I think that's a thought that, that we should all kind of hold dear. And unfortunately, there are all too few liberated minds um, in the world today. Um, I, and then I have another quote that, um, but before I get to it, I want to remember to tell everybody. Um, my PhD is in history, and I have a Texas history book that is out. Um, they just shipped the first uh, shipment of, of books um, yesterday, or not yesterday, Friday. It's called Six Constitutions Over Texas. If you're interested in Texas history, um, it's a history of 19th century Texas. Um, it's uh, somewhat revisionist in nature. It's not as out there as uh, forget the Alamo, but it's not as... <laughs> Uh, but, it, but it's not as contrived as Remember the Alamo either. Um, it tries to actually tell the truth, um, and it's available on, on uh, Amazon, and you know, it, pretty soon it'll be at Barnes & Noble. Um, but what I really came to talk to you about today uh, is what's called the Logos Theology of the Early Christian Church. Um, and the reason I wanted to talk to you about that is because it might be of use to you in conceptualizing um, the relationship between uh, the mystical or the divine, if you wish, and science. Um, those of you who, uh, how many of you uh, are fans of uh, Breaking Bad? I figured there'd be a lot of you in here. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Breaking Bad. Um, if, if you're a fan of Breaking Bad, then you probably are familiar with the name Werner Heisenberg. Um, Heisenberg was actually a scientist, and, and, and Heisenberg said this, which I thought was particularly relevant. The first gulp from the glass of natural sciences will make you an atheist. But at the bottom of the glass, God is waiting for you. That's, uh, that's what Heisenberg said. The real Heisenberg, not, <laughs> not the drug dealer. Um, so let's talk, about, let's talk about the relationship between science and divinity or mysticism as it was understood by the early Christian church. Um, the best place to start, I think, is... Um, the, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Um, and the Word that is, there's going to be a lot of this weird meta stuff. The Word that is translated as Word in that passage, in the beginning was the word. Actually, if you go to a seminary like my friend Mike did, and like I did, if you go to seminary, uh, even if you're not Greek um, like me, um, you'll, you, a lot of people have to memorize that, that passage in Greek. Um, and I, I, if I had my interlinear Bible, I could do it, but I can't right now. Um, the word that's translated as word and capitalized with a W in the beginning of the Gospel of John is the word logos in Greek. Uh, L-O-G-O-S, logos. There are two words for word in Greek. How, uh, how many of you are fans of My Big Fat Greek Wedding? Totally accurate movie. Story of my life. Um, I, I had a great grandmother who wore black all the time and used to get lost in the sprinkler and was looking for Turks and stuff. Yeah, that's, that, that stuff is all very, very accurate. Um, and it is true, like Michael Constantine says in that movie, you know, uh, you know all, all words come from Greek words, or at least we could try to pound the square peg in that round hole. Um, logos is a different word for word than the actual word that's normally used for word in Greek, right? This is like uh, who's on first. Um, the actual word for word in Greek is lexi, 
in plural it would be lexia, okay? And this is why we have lexicons and lexicographers, right? A lexicon is a dictionary, a lexicographer is a person who writes dictionaries. Um, and so any, anytime you see the root, the root lex, okay, that means word. But it means word in a common sense, right? Like the words I'm using now. Logos is a much bigger word, right? And, and it's translated as much more than word, and that's why it's capitalized as word um, in the, the first part of the Gospel of John. What logos means is not just word. In Greek, it also connotes language, rationality, reason, science. Um, if you think about it, rationality is probably the best way to describe it, right? So, so lo the logos is the root word for logic. It's the root word for all of the sciences, right? So, a, you know, so whatever, you know, biology, zoology, um, we add the word logos to the end of those words, whatever they might be, to indicate that they're a science, that they're a study of something. So, you know, when a, some guy wearing a leisure suit who is not a, uh, you know, first language Greek speaker as I am, get, gets on TV and, and says stuff like, well, you know, uh, when they're talking about the logos, they're talking about the, you know, the Bible is the word of God, that, you know, <laughs> That kind of rubs me the wrong way um, because these Greek words have very, like English words, they have very um, complex meanings. They have connotations that you derive from the look on your grandmother's face when she teaches you these words, right? So, so what this passage really says is in the beginning was the Logos and the Logos was with God and the Logos was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, the Logos, and without him, the Logos. Nothing was made that was made. Uh, so where does this conception come from? Um, it, 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 it actually resonates with uh, the very beginning of the Hebrew Bible in Genesis um, chapter 1, um, where at the very beginning, uh, the Hebrew Bible says, in the beginning God made heaven and earth, the earth was invisible and unfinished, and darkness was over the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God called the day day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and morning one day. So, so the Gospel of John relates back to the actual creation narrative in Genesis, which is which is dependent upon God speaking things. God speaks things into existence. Um, and it's also connected with the concept of spirit. The spirit, the earth was without form and the spirit was moving among the waters. And so spirit and word, logos and spirit are connected. In Greek, the word for spirit you know, or if you want to say the Holy Spirit in Greek, you say, o aio, o, o, aio pnevmatos, okay? And, and pnevma is the root word for our English word pneumatic, right? What's a pneumatic tire? What's a pneumatic tire? Air. Yes, a pneumatic tire is a, is a tire that has air in it, right? And so pnevma, spirit, is intimately related with the notion of breathing, right? In the same way that word, logos, is intimately related with the conception of rationality, right? And so when we're talking about these things, when the early church fathers were discussing what they referred to as the Trinity, what they're really talking about is these philosophical conceptions of spirit on the one hand and rationality on the other. And they're connected because you can't speak words if you don't have respiration, right? And so respiration is connected with inspiration because in Latin, the root spir means to breathe. Just like in Greek, the word pnevma is, re, re, means breathe, right? So if you have a pneumothorax, that means you have air in your chest, right? And so... And, and what's interesting about this is we call these cognates. What's interesting about this is that linguistically, these notions of spirituality and breathing on the one hand and logic and word and language on the other, 
they cross ethnic and language barriers, right? They're connected in English in the same way they're connected in Greek. They're connected in Latin in the same way they're connected in Greek and in English. And this has to do with the logos because like Jung, the psychologist said, or the psychiatrist said, there is an architecture to the human mind that we all share as human beings. And that architecture is intimately connected with the whole notion of language. Because, because language requires grammar and grammar requires logic. You can't communicate in the absence of logic because, there, because logic requires that you have certain principles that we all agree upon from which we can reason conclusions. This is all wrapped up in this one word, logos, that the leisure suit guy, well, you know, there's the word of God. You know, he doesn't, he's not getting the full depth of what we're talking about here. Um, so where does this conception come from? Well, like many conceptions uh, of the ancient church, particularly the deep philosophical conceptions, uh, it comes from Greek philosophy. Heraclitus, uh, whose most famous statement was panda ro, which means everything changes, was a pre-Socratic philosopher in the 6th and 5th centuries BC. Um, and, and what he said was, uh, all, all comes to be in accordance with the logos, um, but that humans can't comprehend it. So he, 500 years before Christ, he was talking about the logos as this principle of rationality, this architecture of creation and of the human mind that is in some sense ineffable. We can use it, but we can't deeply penetrate it or fully understand it. Only God can. After that, the Stoics uh, took up this idea. Zeno, uh, Zeno the Stoic, uh, uh, took up this idea. Um, and he talked about the logos spermaticos, right? So what would you think that means, logos spermaticos? Spermaticos? Sperma? The seminal logos, the... The, the, log the seed of creation. Um, so, so this is 300 years before Christ. And then you have Philo of Alexandria, who was a sort of Neoplatonic or Platonic Hellenistic Jew, um, who, whose philosophical writings we have, um, who uh, in typical Platonic terms posited a duality between the ideal forms that Plato uh, theorized about and the reality that is imperfect. He needed an intermediary philosophically for that. What is it that, that mediates between the ideal uh, that is in heaven or in the cave or wherever um, and the reality that is imperfect? And he came up with the concept of the logos as the intermediary. The logos is um, not just the word that is spoken by God or somebody else. If that's all it were, we would use the word lexi. We would use the word that we use that's the root word for dictionaries, right? It's more than that. Uh, it's the root word for psychology, biology, and so on. Um, geology and so on. It's, it has to do with study and with rationality and with the reasoning faculty that only humans possess. Other animals can communicate, but they cannot reason. They don't use grammar, they don't use logic in their communication, and so their communication is limited um, in a way that human uh, communication is not. So, so what we mean by the logos theology is we mean that if you wanna talk in terms of the Trinity, you have the spirit, which has to do with breath, inspiration, and life on the one hand, you have the logos, which has to do with rationality, and you have the creator, in this terminology, the father, the archi would be the Greek word, the archi, the archetype, the, the beginning from which all, others, all other things proceed. Um, but you don't have to think about it in that way if you don't want to. Um, the reason that, that I thought I, you, this might be interesting to you is because of what Heisenberg said, right? Um, because if you really fully understand what logos means and what it means uh, not just in the Hebrew Bible and the, the Greek New Testament but also in ancient philosophy, the conclusion that you come to is that there's no real fundamental irre irreconcilability 
between the notion of creation by God or creation um, from nothing uh, on the one hand and science on the other. This is something that the deists who founded our country believed, people like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, um, is that science the, is the warp and woof, physical laws, physics, is the warp and woof upon which the universe was created or woven by God, if you believe in divine creation. Um, and that that warp and woof is every bit as divine um, as inspiration or poetry or anything else that's associated with the human condition. Um, and that warp and, wor that warp and woof is not just of God or from God, it is God, it's part of God, and it's not inconsistent with science uh, or with, you know, the world being, you know, however many billion years old or the universe being however many billion years old it is because that's all part of God. It was spoken into existence by the Archi in a way that was logical and, phys and, and involved physics and all of the laws, the physical laws that people like Einstein uh, and others took thousands and thousands of years of human effort uh, to deduce. So hopefully that's of some benefit to you in thinking about uh, creationism and science and uh, the fact that uh, belief and science are not necessarily inconsistent. So thank you very much for having me here.